To give us some insight into this year's session of the National People's Congress, we're joined on Skype today by Bob Cap. Bob is the former head of the U.S.-China Business Council and an advisor to Link Asia. Thanks for joining us today, Bob. Glad to be back, you all. Now, first of all, what's your take of the People's Congress? I mean, is it just a rubber stamp for decisions that have already been made, or does it actually have some real authority? Well, the People's Congress legislates. It, it does pass laws. It's got a whole process of drafting and reviewing and reading two or three times over before passing laws, and it will do some of that at this session. At the same time, the message of the People's Congress meeting so regularly every first week of March is a message of regularity and stability to the country as a whole, uh, along with a number of other measures like retirement uh, age limits and term limits, uh, on, uh, or rather length, of, specific length of, uh, of terms for high leaders. The regime over the last 25 years has worked very hard to create and make sure people understand that there is regularity and structure to the highest levels of political process. So the message is, we're meeting on schedule, we're doing what we always do. Now, there's a recent survey taken by the China Institute for Reform and Development, uh, which calls itself an independent think tank, showing that 85% of opinion makers, uh, which includes officials, academics, and business people, say that there's no consensus on reform inside the party and that vested interests are seriously impeding reform. What kinds of reforms are they talking about and, and who's standing in their way? You know, you'll, there is a broad sense among those who think and write about it in China now that something needs to be done, that the current uh, operating system of the country has pretty much kind of run out of gas, and that new reforms, whether economic or political, need to be undertaken. The World Bank and a major Chinese think tank have just come out with a big and very important paper called China 2030, laying out a series of economic restructurings and reapproaching reapproaches to the economy that China needs to undertake if it, if it doesn't want to stagnate over the next uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. This, the quieter but equally important discussion is political. And uh, on that, there are people now, sometimes uh, think tank people, liberal, intellectual people online, who are saying that the system as it currently is operating uh, needs to be, needs to be uh, really shaken up, that interest groups, coalitions of high officials and powerful industrialists have gained too much power over the country as a whole, and that there needs to be some kind of a reinvigoration of the political process. What it should be, however, is very much under discussion. Nobody's got a detailed plan. Now, it seems that a lot of uh, Chinese with money uh, are voting with their feet. Uh, a survey taken by the Bank of China last fall found that nearly half the country's millionaires want to leave or are making active plans to take their money, their kids, and themselves out of China. What does that tell you about how people think about China's future? Well, this is comforting for Americans who like to say, aha, we're better than they are. They all want to get out and come over, live over here where the air is clean and, and the opportunities are great and so forth. But there's more to it than that. Uh, the, the Chinese today have a large number of people who have a kind of disposable income and wealth that has been unknown in, in, uh, in the recent history and modern history of the country. At the same time, China has become a world player in every sense. And some of those people are saying, look, the world is out there. We should go out and take part in it, participate in it. We should send our kids to, to schools in other countries if they can get a good education there. We might want to make productive investments of our own wealth, our own business wealth in other countries. And America looks good in that regard. The third thing, of course, is back to my notion that there, there is a sense in China that, that things are coming to a boil, uh, that, that tensions that have been below the surface are now breaking up on the surface. I'm sure there are some people with wealth in China who are saying, look, we need a place to get to if we need to get out of town for a while, if we need to get out of Dodge. We need some place uh, where we can send one of our kids to buy a house and to get a job or in one way or another, have a base outside of China, just in case the tensions and the indecision, whether they be political or economic or social, that we now see in our country get to the point where we no longer feel secure. Great, thanks so much, Bob. Bob Cap is a business consultant and former head of the U.S.-China Business Council. A quick fact about the 3,000 delegates to the National People's Congress. The wealthiest 2% of the NPC has an average wealth of almost $1.5 billion. Compare that with the wealthiest top 2% of the U.S. Congress, which has an average wealth of $323 million, less than a quarter of their Chinese counterparts. Airwaves, a global channel of uncompromising stories. World news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV.
connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.